Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, as Matt mentioned, I'll be talking about you know, leveraging a 3D genome and translational research um, and uh, biomarker discovery for improved diagnostics and therapeutic strategies. Um, we are Arima Genomics. Uh, my name is Ibrahim uh, Javanji. Um, I lead uh, product management at Arima. Uh, we've been around since 2015, um, commercialized our uh, first product in 2018. It's been a, an exciting time. Um, a lot of amazing progress has been uh, made with our research and I'm happy to share it with you. Um, I'll just kind of, just a high level agenda, you know, I'll just kind of give an introduction about, you know, 3D genome profiling and, and um, how our technology is able, like the characteristics of the 3D genome that are uncovered with our technology. Um, I'll go through some, practical, really nice um, case studies um, in biomarker discovery, um, one around characterizing disease subtypes, another one um, that kind of uses our technology to identify a novel uh, therapeutic approach. And then um, just kind of finish it off with just general overview of, uh, of, of Arima Genomics and, and uh, the things that we, we have to offer um, for um, biomarker discovery and companion diagnostics. So I I, this is a fairly new um, area of research, I think, relative to overall genomics, right? I think um, traditional genomics has, you know, over the past decade, um, it's been very linear and focused, right? Next-gen sequencing, PCR, we typically look at things as if it's a straight line. Um, the reality is, is that um, genomes are a bit more complex than that, and then uh, most technologies simply ignore the three-dimensional characteristics that occur, and those characteristics actually have implications in disease. Um, Arima has um, high C um, technology that we've developed and optimized, and enables multiple dimensions of genome interrogation. Um, to, at, a, at the highest level, um, and, and hopefully this is not too, um, 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 you know, basic science, but you know, genomes, um, chromosomes, genomes are broken down into chromosomes which are spatially conserved into territories. Now, the reason why this is important is that um, technologies like Hi-C allow you to digitally karyotype um, chromosomes based on this fact that they are spatially conserved, right? And when there are abnormalities such as like um, chromosomal rearrangements, um, you can detect that quite easily and sensitively with a technology like Hi-C that is specifically designed to capture the three-dimensional characteristics, right? You kind of show a little bit of a high-level digital karyotype that's generated from a high C contact map on the left side and how you can detect abnormalities um, in that digital karyotype on the right side when there are rearrangements that occur. The next level of um, the nuclear organization is that uh, chromosomes are typically broken into spe cell-specific active A compartments and inactive B compartments. Now, these are, again, these are cell specific. So if there are um, aberrations in those compartment types within a given cell, oftentimes in cancer, you will see <clears throat> different domains that have been activated and, or inactivated um, that are tied to um, compartment level organization, which are not sequence driven, right? This is epigenetic type changes that you can detect by looking at the three dimensional characteristics of the genome and the compartmentalization of the genome. The next level of organization is around, um, uh, is, is that chromosome compartments are organized into topologically associated domains. <clears throat> and, and this is, excuse me, these are conserved across cell types. So um, this type, typically each cell in the body has the same um, topolo topologically associated domain. It's just a matter of whether it's in the active or inactive compartment. Um, and these domains, um, the disruption of these domains are actually imp um, typically imply some sort of disease. So um, because these are preserved, these are signatures that can be used to identify um, potential misregulation or, or elements that have, um, in one of the case studies we'll talk about enhancer hijacking, cause like where you have um, distal enhancers interacting with a promoter in a, in, an, in a completely different region of the chromosome that you wouldn't be able to detect looking at it from a linear perspective. And then finally, the most basic element um, that is captured with an approach like Hi-C is that is chromatin loops, so within, uh, or DNA loops. So within each TAD, DNA is looped together with the assistance of architectural proteins and histones. Um, these loops um, are, um, uh, measuring these DNA loops can help you characterize which regulatory elements are interacting with different promoter sites. And those elements often drive expression or repression 
when you compare these across cell to cell or disease versus um, treatment, you can easily identify um, potentially which variants have led to some sort of, uh, which non-coding regulatory elements actually led to a disease, or um, it can help you link, um, yeah, like non-coding regulatory elements uh, to target genes. Um, it helps, helps, helps uh, researchers understand the mechanisms that drive gene expression rather than just looking at the output itself from RNA-seq or other technologies. On the right-hand side, I um, mentioned I, I have shown, you know, the types of data that are typically used to visualize this type of information um, in a digital format using HiC. And, you know, this, this uh, area of research has been, has led to a lot of um, progress in, across multiple disciplines. Right, so because we're able to illuminate the mechanisms that drive gene regulation in this regulation, um, it's been used in areas of oncology, um, uh, immunology, cardiology, development disease, and stem cell biology. Um, <clears throat> I'm positive I'm missing key features, uh, key research areas that I haven't covered here, but the point is, is that, um, you know, 3D genome biology has led to a lot of um, discoveries within human biomedical research. And, um, you know, at ARIMA, this may sound corny, but we like to say that the idea of a flat genome is as archaic as uh, the idea of a flat earth. Um, if in order to fully understand um, the human genome, we need to look at it in all its dimensions and um, it'll allow you to capture, capture the spatial properties and um, deliver valuable sequence, structural and regulatory information from a single type of signature. All right. so. Um, so moving away from the introduction and kind of going into a little bit of the um, real research here, I'm going to cover two case studies um, related to uh, biomarker discovery, one tied to um, disease subtyping and another one tied to um, that a novel therapeutic option. Um, the first case study we'll, we'll um, cover um, is uh, driven by um, Dr. Lindsay Montefiore at St. Jude um, uh, Children's Hospital. Her and her current colleagues had uh, recently published in um, Cancer Discovery, um, Enhancer Hijacking Drives uh, Oncogenic BCL11B Expression and Lineage Ambiguous uh, Stem Cell uh, Leukemias. Um, this category of disease is, is high risk malignancies under poorly understood genetic basis. Um, and um, Lindsay had used uh, two um, HiC technologies to help carry out this research. One is uh, what's called genome-wide HiC. So looking at, um, the, the 3D genome profile across the entire genome and a targeted approach called high chip, which is um, looking at three-dimensional uh, profiles anchored on, um, anchored based off of protein targets, in this case, um, H3K um, 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 acetyl, H3K27 acetyl. Um, so uh, Lindsay began her work um, profiling RNA um, across 1,100 lineage ambiguous stem cell um, leukemia samples and clustered that using, um, again, RNA-seq. Now, certain clusters were poorly characterized, leading to multiple um, uh, different diagnoses, which is indicated here on the left-hand side. And, um, you know, because of the type of analyte, it wasn't able to alone um, confidently type these, these different cancers. So one cluster that she focused on was BCL11B. Um, and was able to <clears throat> uh, further interrogate that and understand what is the actual um, driver behind this specific cluster of, um, of cancer samples and determined that is a result of um, an, a phenomenon called enhancer hijacking. Um, as, a, as a side note, this particular subtype was inconsistently characterized as multiple diagnostic entities, which can cause, you know, problems within the clinic, right? If, you, if you're not able to accurately diagnose the type of um, uh, cancer that is being expressed in a patient, it can lead to ineffective therapies later on. So over here on the top left, um, we show a contact map um, that's generated through high C data. And it, it's kind of to indicate how um, BCL11B is typically um, not expressed and um, inactive and CD34 positive um, HSPCs. However, when whole genome sequencing was done um, on, these, on these different samples, there was uh, structural aberrations that were de um, detected upstream and downstream of the gene body. Um, some of the major ones were between um, chromosomes, chromosome 6 and chromosome 14, 
And then another one uh, was a focal amplification on chromosome 14 itself. And these two kind of care, um, these two types of structural aberrations were detected. Um, and uh, these uh, trans, yeah, right. So transchromosomal rearrangements in addition to focal amplification of those non-coding, these are all both non-coding regions. And uh, these non-coding rearrangements uh, resulted in BCL11B activation via non-coding super enhancers, right? So um, the structural rearrangement occurred in a non-coding um, region, a uh, super enhancer regulatory element activated BCL11B, um, which was then detected using um, high C technology. Furthermore, that non-coding focal amplification was able to detect, be detected, um, the term beta here, was able to activate um, BCL11B um, from a distal, um, distal site. And this high C data is able to clearly indicate not just the fact that there was a structural rearrangement, but to also link that rearrangement and variation to a target gene and the activation of that target gene. So kind of just to recap, this detection of enhancer hijacking allowed us to kind of confirm that not only was there a rearrangement between two chromosomes in, the non, in a, a non-coding region, but also link them together using three-dimensional um, spatial profiling. What this, why this is important is that, you know, 30% of cancers have a known pathogenic structural variant used in diagnosis or treatment stratification. Um, this research is, is a quite difficult considering that um, many of these very structural variants occur in non-coding regions. Many of the assays exist that exist today just don't have the capabilities to one, um, either detect those variations or two, link them to disease. Um, and so high C technology in this particular case was able to um, sensitively do both. Trans and cis chromosomal rearrangements were detected. And then furthermore, they can be linked back to the activation of those distal promoters um, through um, the, the three-dimensional interaction. So going back, just kind of some key takeaways. Um, characterization of a new cancer subtype was defined within lineage ambiguous leukemia tied to BCL11B and the mechanisms behind, the, behind that characterization. Um, there, those two mechanisms that were identified um, primarily were focal amplification of a novel um, um, element called beta and uh, structural rearrangements um, between um, non-coding regions um, across two different chromosomes that led to then the activation via super enhancer to um, BCL11B. So not only uh, were these different um, rearrangements and aberrations detected, but they were definitively linked together using an assay called high chip which um, was able to link, um, um, definitively link these non-coding regulatory elements to BCL11B. Uh, you know, Dr. Lindsay Montefiore does a really good job of explaining this research in a lot more detail. Uh, we do have um, her webinar featured on our website and the, the link to the paper is also um, in Cancer Discovery. So we have a link in here. Um, if you are able to kind of see the recording of this presentation, you can kind of um, catch that there too. The next uh, case study I wanted to go over um, is um, identifying a new epigenetic therapeutic option for treatment resistant disease. Um, and this particular one, um, as it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so I wanted to give an example that was related to that, um, related to um, endocrine, endocrine resistant breast cancer. And um, this case study actually spans two different studies. Um, one is uh, epigenetic reprogramming, um, at estrogen receptor binding sites um, by Dr. Joanna achinger uh, And this one was published in Nature Communications um, late last year. Um, the next one, um, the next um, paper is um, currently in a preprint. Um, and it has to do, it's more of a follow-up study to this previous one where they uh, identify um, potential um, epigenetic therapeutic targets and then now apply uh, a target to determine whether or not it actually showed a, um, an effect. So um, estrogen receptor is a defining and driving transcription factor in the majority of breast cancers, and its target genes dictate you know, endocrine sensitivity status uh, of ER positive breast cancer cells. So by comparing the 3D genome profiles of ER positive MCF7, which is responsive to both uh, fulvorescent and temoxifen, 
to um, uh, um, fulfrestin and tamoxifen-resistant counterparts, Joanna and colleagues determined that the resistance cell lines exhibited common losses of um, TADs or topologically associated domains tied to um, the key estrogen receptor genes, which therefore results in resistance to hormone therapy. Uh, these TAD disruptions are further associated with hypermethylation, right, which um, uh, disrupted the 3D um, um, characteristics of that, um, uh, of those genes. And uh, the team also proposed what would happen if we were able to hypomethylate those regions and would that reactivate the genes that um, enable um, to, to help um, reactivate those tumor suppressor genes and then uh, bring uh, therapeutic effectiveness back and those ER positive um, uh, treatment resistant cell lines. So then it goes back to the next, uh, next follow-up paper where um, uh, Dr. Uh, Joanna had then used, uh, followed up with an ER positive endocrine resistant breast, line, breast cancers and applied a treatment known as decetabine, which is a known um, FDA approved um, epigenetic therapy, which has hypomethylating, acti demethylating activity. Um, applying this resulted in activation of, um, a hype, um, re reactivation of a very beneficial um, uh, endocrine resistant, um, endocrine, uh, sorry, uh, estrogen uh, receptor pathways that uh, and lead to good outcomes in uh, um, breast cancer. So application of decetabine results in hypomethylation and the uh, enhancer sites led to uh, specifically the genes like KRT8, um, SPADA18 and MYO3B. The promoter capture high C profile um, shows here that, you know, the hypomethylation activity of decetabine results in insulation of this promoter, but post-treatment, you can see that the therapy was indeed effective and that it reactivates SPADA18 and then uh, is able to kind of link back to the specific enhancers that um, the SPADA18 relies on for um, uh, reactivation. And so, so key, some key takeaways with this particular case study is that the mechanisms driving endocrine resistance in uh, ER positive breast cancer um, were defined um, using this HIC method. Um, post treatment promoter capture profiles um, that were used in uh, the follow up study um, confirmed reactivation of key genes tied to a positive um, um, predicted patient outcomes for um, ER positive breast cancer patients. And then finally, uh, preclinical, this shows that preclinical evidence of using an on market epigenetic therapy to suppress these types, specific types of endocrine resistant breast cancers. So not only were we able to kind of identify the mechanisms that drove um, treatment resistance, but also propose a new uh, therapy, a therapy therapeutic option that could then um, enable um, better treatment for, uh, for these particular sample types. And then to kind of uh, finish it off, um, I had to rush through here a little bit, but um, what would it be like to kind of, uh, what does Rima Genomic kind of bring to the picture on this? So, um, you know, over the past uh, five years, we've had more than a hundred um, publications um, featuring our technology, many of them in, in key publications like Nature and, and Cell. But what we're very proud of is our proven utility with um, across translational applications. Um, one of the things that we have been really focused on is making sure that the technology is compatible with clinically relevant samples. So um, uh, cell cultures, primary cells, blood, uh, fresh frozen tissue and FFPE samples, we wanted to make sure that um, the, the technology would be able to robustly um, capture three-dimensional genetic information, which allows you to do structural variant detection and, and discovery to um, connect those um, variants to um, uh, target genes that they may result in um, that may result in disease, and then um, ultimately capture the underlying mechanisms that drive disease. Furthermore, we have the Arima High C Plus technology platform. Um, you know, the at the highest level, the genome wide folding um, assay is our is our core assay that we launched with, and it at a high level can assist with digital karyotyping of your samples to detect aberrations and genome structure or chromosome compartments. And of course, deeper sequencing allows you to capture even finer details like uh, topologically associated domains 
and uh, gene, regula gene regulatory relevant loop calls that infer um, mis or, or um, misregulation or, or, or mechanisms behind the disease. Um, more targeted approaches are available too. Um, so um, HiChip is a discovery platform that combines 1D chromatin immunoprecipitation with long range 3D interactions. So for example, CTCF HiChip can be used to pr um, produce contact maps anchored on those TAD boundaries I mentioned earlier. So if you're trying to kind of assess um, uh, whether boundaries have been disrupted, you can do CTCF HiChip to not only look at the anchors of those boundaries, but also um, determine um, which regions have, they, have been impacted by that disruption. Another example is H3K27 acetyl high chip, um, which was used in the Montefiore um, case study I mentioned earlier, which um, binds to active enhancer promoter sites and also captures the long range information tied to that site. So you not only, um, so this is quite useful for let's say a genome wide association studies that have uh, multiple non-coding variants that are implicated in disease, um, but it, only a few of those variants might actually um, mechanistically cause that disease. So G, um, high chip can help you kind of link those non-coding variants to their target promoters and determine um, mechanistically what is actually driving disease in a particular sample. And then, you know, discovery platforms um, as it are typically um, influenced with inconsistencies inherent in biology. Um, they sometimes can't be as scalable. So we also have our Capture High C platform um, the, cap the promoter capture panels um, described here are a pre-designed genome-wide panel that targets all promoters using um, a capture-based technology solution, which is fairly common, akin to exome capture. And it captures all promoters for human and mouse genomes. Um, this approach ensures you capture um, all the interactions with all regulatory elements um, across promoters uh, in the sample that you're interested in. And this is one of the um, um, assays that were used by Joanna et al. Um, when they were doing their um, um, uh, comparison of treatment versus vehicle um, um, impact on the regulatory pathways. And then uh, the custom capture panels can also be designed against um, genes of interest, um, entire gene regions. Um, we can use that to identify and link variants to their target genes through three-dimensional three interactions. And you could also, um, if you're interested in a smaller set of promoters that um, are more uh, relevant to to your area of research, you can design promoter, smaller promoter capture panels that are um, tied to your regions of interest. And then finally, just to kind of, it, again, this has been an exciting um, period for ARIMA. We've been working with a number of companies already um, uh, to assist with their biomarker programs. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been quite a ride as we kind of continue to refine and develop our technologies to meet the needs of these various organizations. So in summary, I want to um, end it off here. HiC technology enables interrogation beyond the linear genome. Um, and 3D genomes capture sequence, structural, and regulatory elements that can improve disease typing and sample stratification, identify potential therapeutic targets, and assess therapeutic response. Um, as a whole, the ARIMA platform can assist in discovery, validation, and screening of biomarkers using whole genome and targeted approaches. And with that, I wanted to kind of leave a few minutes for any questions that uh, anyone may have and um, go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was uh, really, really cool. The one question is a really good question is, um, how does chromothripsis uh, or, uh, you know, chromosomal instability challenge or maybe even um, you know, help in the discovery methods uh, for, for this high C approach, um, or does it not impact it? The high C approach does it not impact. Me, so like, yeah, how does, how does chromosomal instability or chromothripsis where you have massive um, um, you know, shattering of, of, uh, of the genome affect um, the, the mapping of the 3D genome? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think we don't, I don't have data on hand to kind of answer that particular question, but uh, I can definitely take that back and uh, answer it. I think yeah. that was uh, um, uh, Dr. Richard Hughes. Yeah, that's a good question. Richard Hughes, yes. I'll, I'll ask yeah. that question. It's a very good question. I, yeah. I don't have an answer to that. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, another question I had was, you know, you've, you've probably done a lot of work with cell lines or, um, you know, Put, you know, kind of arresting them at a certain cell cycle and kind of looking at the temporal um, architecture of the genome. 
how does how does like the heterogeneity of uh, you know cycling cells or senescent cells? How do you resolve that in a? I mean, can you do this? At, you can't do this at single cell level, or maybe that's next. But you know, in a in a in an admixture of cells and different cell types, how do you get the signal there? You need a certain purity. Right. Factor. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, with the bulk with bulk samples, you're getting you're essentially getting a, an average of all those signals, right? Um, what we're able to kind of detect at this time, for, first and foremost, is are there for for a practical biomarker application? Are there certain um, you know structural variants that are causing that particular disease? Yeah. That's step one, right? Step two is then identifying: do those variants actually implicate or activate certain genes that, or even repress certain genes, or the disruptions in the boundaries that um, should not are not expected? So um, at at a bulk tissue sample level, you're getting those averages. Um, but definitely there's a lot of research done in cells um, um, across different cell cycles. And then, and definitely, you know, the future path um, could potentially be towards, you know, looking at it as a single cell level or even kind of um, splitting it apart and uh, doing fact sorting to kind of um, separate things out. Yeah. Very cool. Um, I could keep on asking questions forever. This is really cool. Uh, but we'll, we'll move on to the next, uh, next talk. Uh, uh, so. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, no, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, oh, actually, I think. We